It is time for the suffering class, and well, they are the cousin Francois, the premier class. Well, this is where I get to have a little bit of fun with you because the French, as you know, often try my patience. They go from producing wonderful ships to producing terrible ships. They get they become faddy more often than any other nation on earth when it comes to their navies. They will literally jump from fad to fad. And it's frustration more than anything that makes me sound so, you know, disdainful of them. Because they can produce these good things. And yet they willingly set themselves up not to. However, there are times when they're dogged independence and determination to go their own way fills me with joy because the French are the only navy, the only navy which has the understanding to admit that what they are building is not a Heavy cruiser. I know I have been getting complaints from people going, Alex, you're turning into a top Trump's historian. Alex, you sound like you're talking top Trump's again. And I'm not. It's that something is either a heavy cruiser or it is not. Something is either a light cruiser or it is not. Something is either a cruiser or it is not. And in a world where your treaty is defining what your capital ships are going to be, rather than defining those battleships and battle cruisers, in a world where it's defining your aircraft carriers, where it's defining your destroyers, where it's defining all these things, a world which has taken a light cruiser, a large light cruiser, but still a light cruiser, as its template to design and define standards for cruisers, for escorts, is not a world where a heavy cruiser is going to be a heavy cruiser in anything but name. It just isn't. And I give you the French, who come up with these beautiful names. And I will let Google Translate produce them for you. That is Cousin de Première Classe. Croze de première classe. It's always lovely. Croze de première classe. Always nice when Google produces it. And even better. Croze de deuxième classe. Croze de deuxième classe, or second class cruiser. Both of them are substrates of the Croze Liger, which is the light cruiser, because none of them, none of them are considered. Cruiser Cuirass. Cruiser Cuirass. A.K.A. Armoured Cruiser. A.K.A. Heavy Cruiser. A.K.A. Thank you, Marine Nationale. You are the only Navy in the 1920s and 30s which was prepared to admit this. And for that, you earn my, uh, my undying affection in so, so many ways. So, expect the suffering class to have a slightly different review than you might have expected. Now, the Ducassine class I have problems with. I have problems with because of various issues in its design. The Sufferin class I actually have a lot less problems with because it's moving along its pathway. But there is something I'm going to admit now. Before we get into anything in terms of discussions, I'm going to say something. Now, coming up, I have some lives. The lives of the patrons this this week's, next week's, and then the lives coming the weeks after that while we're running the July votes. Oh, French Cruiser Design Doctrine. Now, for various reasons, due to that, and due to the importance of yards to the construction, of French cruisers and the issues of yards, and I'll be getting into some of those things, I'm not going to actually specifically delve into the yards. Today's video, 
because, frankly, they're part of the whole issue. And I'm, but strange enough, they're going to continue to be part of everyone else's videos. But for the French, they're just not. They're going to be part of that. And it's long associated long patrol. But this is the suffering class. This is the beautiful suffering class. This is everything they are. And I do love these ships. I do find them something of an interesting vessel. I find them nicely designed. I like their lines. I can even understand their armor layout because once you realize that you are not designing a heavy cruiser in name, because it will be a heavy cruiser in name only. Cruiser de première classe. Makes sense to have Enough of armor belt to deal with the fire of destroyers. At probably maximum range for the destroyers, but at a decent range for the 8-inch guns to deal with. Now, I do have some problems with the mounts and the weapon systems. My biggest problem with the guns is that they can, they only have the ability to turn to 90 degrees either side, so they can go 90 degrees positive or negative. Um which is lovely, it gives them 180 degrees sort of movement, but that means you can't do that on that, which means, well, theoretically, the safest place to stick your ship, the most likely place they can't engage you, well, if you're anywhere forward 180 degrees, they can't hit you. Because they can't angle in backwards, and because of the way shots spread them out, if you actually manage to chart a parallel course with this cruiser, theoretically, theoretically, you could avoid getting hit. Think about that. These guns have a plus 90 or negative 90 traverse. That way, that way. Not all... I'm not saying that that's a unique to them issue, but I'm saying they've given these guns some absolutely beautiful lines of sight. Look at this aft gun. Look at how much clearance it has forward gun as well. What I would call A and Y, what they would call 1 and 4 turrets. And yet, they haven't fitted them the cable or anything to take advantage of it. And I just... It just seems such a waste to me. You've got this beautiful design and you... For want of some cable, really. And some cable management, of course, but, you know. In the scheme of things, not a lot of weight for displacement. But still, they are a good class. And here is the gun we're talking about now. I'm going to have a discussion about this, and I'm going to have a discussion about the sources, because I've been going through a lot of books. I've been going through, especially Jordan and his... Oh, I keep forgetting his colleague, because I had Jordan's books, and I keep forgetting the name of his colleague who with him, Jordan and Molan. So it's Jean Molan and John Jordan produced a book in 2013 called French Cruisers, 1922 to 1956, which was published by Seaforth. It's a really good book. I do have a copy. Normally, I would be planning on showing you a aforementioned copy and talking about it. However, it has been nicked. It was here with the warships after Washington and the warships after London. And this book wasn't here. It was here, but it wasn't here. Because, basically, this book, you will notice, appeared here a couple of videos ago. It appeared there 
just after I'd started and recorded the first version of this video. That was because the book which had been there, which had been Mr. Jordan's and Mulan's other book, has gone wandering. My mum says I'll get it back once she's finished with it. She's really enjoying reading about how the French were fairly decent for a bit, but then managed to descend back into being not so good with ships. She's still trying to quite understand that one. Being as someone who worked in Lloyd's Register for the time she did have, she has a passion for ships, and she never quite understands why the French put all the money in, become very good at shipbuilding, and then ignore it, and it goes to it goes terrible again. And then does that. She's, she's still trying to work out why they take a cyclical approach to their shipbuilding. She feels that's very expensive and wasteful. Anyway, leaving that to one side. <sighs> it's chapter three, which has most of the sufferance for them. We can, thankfully, also talk about this, these guns. And these guns are really something special. They're 203 millimeter. They are a 15th model 1924 gun. They're fitted on Ducassine, Suffren, Surkov, Aldri classes. So they do a submarine and free class all the heavy cruisers. Um, the gun weighs a total of 20.389 tons, or that's 20.716 metric tons, including the breech mechanism. Their grooving is 60, that's uh, 0.7 inch deep, times 0.925 inch, so thickness, their swellings, and the 60 is the number of grooves basically they have running through. Gun length overall. 10.5 meters or 413.4 inches. The bore length, slightly different, 10.150 meters or 3.399.6 inches. Gives you an idea of what the breech length is. Rate of fire. Now, the planned rate of fire for cruisers, this is as Navy weapons. And by the way, if you see any ones, twos, or whatever those things are, there is a reason for that, and I'll be explaining it shortly. Um, the planned rate of fire was five to six rounds per minute. Practice, though, as is often the case, was lower. Partially, I'm thinking, because of the weight of ammunition. Uh, you've got roughly 123.1 kilograms, 100 for, for the semi-arm piercing, uh, 134 kilograms for the APC, and 123.82 kilograms for the high explosive. Bursting charge, all lengths, etc. All these things are fairly heavy. And then you've got an approximate barrel life of 600 rounds. Ouch. So, yeah, four to five, uh, four to five rounds per minute was what they re really reached. Five to six was what they planned. Surkov was supposed to do three rounds a minute, but <laughs> oh, let's be honest, that wasn't going to happen. So, Navy Weps. Now, the charts you will see here, I found myself doing something, because I was cross-checking with Navy Weps, because I use it as a site I can stick up on the screen. It's fairly accurate, and I can cross-check with it and the sources, and so I've got two sources, basically. I've got a book usually open of that on the screen, and I'm writing up my chart. What I found I was doing was I was copying out of my book, pretty much, to produce the chart, because I haven't gone to the archives to do the research on these things. I'm using Jordan's work, and Mulan, and his colleagues. And they're lovely. They're good. It's good work. But, I then looked at Navy Weps, and I went, hang on, I'm... Hmm? 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 And realised I was pretty much writing out word for word what Navy Weps was saying on their site from the book. So, in the end, what I did was, I used Navy Weps as sources for the tables. Basically went, clunk, clunk, 
what I think is the useful information from those tables and checked the Navy Whips table with the book. A, it sped up the process, but B, it allows me to do this because usually I highlight a source and I highlight some sources. And Navy Webs is a really good source. They are the sort of people who don't sing their own praises often enough or loudly enough. But if you want to go find out about these guns, if you want to find out good detail about them, they are a good source. A very good source for a quick uh, a quick reference, and I do note that on the M uh, two hundred three mm uh, the fifty, i.e. the gun eight inch gun of nineteen twenty four, they have this note on sources. Many reference state that Algeri used a longer thirty five caliber gun, but recent research by John Jordan and Jean Milan in their French cruisers nineteen twenty two fifty six has determined that she carried the fifty caliber guns, as did the older cruisers. And then you go down to the source list and you go, ooh, and they have all the pictures. And the source list includes Naval Weapons of World War II by John Campbell, French Cruiser 1922, by John Jordan and Jean Marlin, and Cruiser of World War II by M.J. Whitley, as well as Navies of the Second World War, the French Navy by Henri Lamasson. That is one of the books I don't have. I am hunting a copy of that. John Jordan apparently also had an email conversation with them on the 14th of February 2022 which is really nice. And Warship Volume 7, article by Francis J. Allen. So, they also have the Ministère de la Defence, which is always a nice source to be able to have, the Ministry of Defence. So, yeah. I decided that's a fairly good quality source. And I looked at all their systems and went, you're all fairly good quality sources. And you have some very cool pictures. And so I will make use of you. And I will sing your praises and say, please go to them. Right. The class stats. Now, the class are pretty darn cool. And I have to admit that they are pretty darn cool. These stats are mostly for the Suffren which starts out as a Kreuzer Liga and then becomes, as you have heard it, and I will say it again, Kreuzer de Première Classe. Or rather... Kreuzer de Première Classe. Yep. That's because they have 8-inch guns. They are Première Classe. First Class. They are still not a heavy cruiser. They are just a First Class cruiser. And there is a difference, a very difference in that phrase. That's basically saying, of the class of cruisers, this is the first class, that is the second class. First class is 8 inch, second class is 6 inch. Okay? It's almost applying a rating system. Now, Suffren herself displaces 10,160 tons, that's 10,000 long tons, in stab. 11,769 tons, or in 11,583 long tons, in normal. 13,135 tons, that's 12,928 long tons, in full load. So the difference between standard and full load is 2,928 tons. Length, 194 meters overall, 185 meters though between the perpendiculars. Beam, 19.26 meters. Draft, 6.51 meters at normal displacement. Please note that's at normal. It does get lower when it's full. Six gear de temple boilers. Plus two small coal, coal oil fired boilers, which are different, are removed in Fock and I think also in duplex. But I'll be getting on to design changes at about the halfway mark later on. They use a Rato Bretang single reduction geared steam turbine, with one on each of the three shafts, for a total speed of, uh, well, total shaft horsepower of 88,768.8. Now, again, one of the interesting things to note is that the French, as a rule, do not give statistics in terms of hot shaft horsepower. They use chevaux. That's C H E V A U X. 
CV, or sometimes abbreviated as CV, or horses rather, is used. And to convert shaft horsepower, well, to get shaft horsepower from Chevaux, you have to multiply the Chevaux value by 0 0.98632. Some sources don't do this. Hence, well, I have to say, it's where it's fine and special. The French Cruisers does give it, the book does give this, and shows the horsepower values as only CV, but gives the value for the conversion of the shaft horsepower. It's worthwhile considering and understanding the differences. But anyway, top speed, 32 knots, fine. And a range of 1,000, well, how to put this? A range of 4,600 nautical miles at 15 knots if carrying 1,876 tons of oil and 500 tons of coal. She's able to do 2,000 nautical miles at 11 knots on just the cruise boilers, which I presume are the coal ones, 3,700 nautical miles at 20 knots. Complement 773. Armaments, of course, the 8 inch guns, um, some 75 millimeter guns. On Suffren alone, the rest are fitted with 90 millimeter guns. I'll be getting into those though. 12 Hotchkiss M1929 machine guns. Uh, there's a debate on to what mounts they're supposed to be on. There's a debate on to whether they're fitted. There's a debate on to so many things about those Hotchkiss machine guns that I'll be enjoying going through them. And then we have the joy that is the torpedoes because it's six 550mm, that's roughly 22 inch torpedo tubes. Now, it's a model 1925T triple mount. But they carry nine model 1923D two lawn torpedoes. Welcome to the fun. Belt. There is a dispute as to whether it's 50mm or 60mm, but most of the current sources seem to claim 60, so I'm going to go with 60. Deck, 25mm. Turrets and conning tower, 30mm. Magazine box, again, a debate of 50 or 60, and sides up to 20mm on the crown. Um, they carried GL 8010s or Loire New Pond 130s, and they had two catapults for those aircraft. Now, why am I showing you the most despicable thing ever created by the French Navy, and the reason why, as much as I love the fact that they have the Cruiser de Premier class and the Cruiser de Dux class, let me get that right and make sure I get that right. Cruiser de Deuxième Classe. Cruiser de Dizian class, I have a very big problem with that. I understand why it comes about, I understand what it is about, but the fact is they could always build a second one and they don't make up for it. And I think having a French carrier, a proper carrier, would have been a good thing. But the Canon, the 75mm, model 1924, is a really cool piece of engineering. It's something I have a lot of time and affection for. It's also interesting to note that it has a rate far listed as 8 to 15 rounds per minute. Now, that's important. Because whilst the Suffren only carries around this, and there is a theoretical rate of fire of 15 rounds per minute, the practical rate of fire is 8 rounds per minute. The reason given is because of the weight of the ammunition. That's not unusual. The weight of the completed round is 12 kilograms. That's quite heavy, but not massive. It's 26 and a half pounds. So 12 kilograms. You can, a single person can heft it, but you're going to know about it. There are debates at sort of what angle they can still be load at, are loaded at, but we do know that basically what they've taken is they've taken the 75mm SP 75mm and shortened the barrel. 
The SP 75mm is always known as the Model 1908 and was built prior to World War One. Gave it higher elevation mounting and it uses an AA round. Fires, AA gun, fires fixed rounds. Now, people are going to turn around and go, but this is out of date by 1939. It probably is out of date by about 1940-41. But, honestly, if it's when it's being fitted in, 1920, in 1920s, uh, dated designs, 1922, 1924, and date inserts from 1926. It's probably bang on the money and fairly good at its job. And I'm still quite keen on it. And it only has weight in a ton. If you're looking for the examples on the burn, do not look at these casemate guns. Look at these things. Those are 75 millimeters. Interestingly enough, usually we refer to as 75, 76 millimeter as a three-inch gun, which is sort of right because if we consider correctly, it should be seventy-six point two millimeters because it's twenty-five point four millimeters in an inch. However, these ones, which are seventy-five millimeters, are usually referred to as 2.95 inch guns in some British circles. I have no idea why, because I'd say, honestly, give or take no difference, that's basically a 3 inch gun. But that's why I have a gap between a 75mm up there. I want to emphasize that. So the 90mm. Now... <sighs> it's a pretty good weapon. It is something which I have... A lot of respect for. Mainly because it uses an auto-threaded barrel and a semi-automatic Schneider breech mechanism. All to try and speed up its, its firing. Now... All members of the Suffren class, other than Suffren, carry this. Loading is difficult at elevations above 60 degrees, and rate of fire drops to 10, around 10 rounds per minute when you are above 60 degrees. But it can fire between 12 and 15 rounds a minute when it's below 60 degrees, so that's pretty good. Fact is, it can seem to go quite high. And it does fire, though, an 18 kilogram round. So the previous round was roughly 12 and a bit. Yeah, 12.01 kilograms. This one is a 50% heavier round. Now, on the Suffren class, but not Suffren, of course, they stow 500 rounds per gun. So, if you think about it, if you're firing 12 to 15 rounds a minute, let's say it's actually practically it's 10 rounds a minute. Because I do love the way they put it in as going height, but there's also, it, it, it is, please note, a semi-automatic, not an automatic, and an auto-fretted barrel, but it's a semi-automatic breech mechanism, not an automatic breech mechanism. There is a difference. So, let's say you're firing 10 rounds a minute. You've got 50 minutes worth of AA cover from your heavy AA guns. Dual purpose systems. And a 90mm mount is a fairly decent mount to have. And a similar list of very good quality sources. Suffering. Now look at those lines. She is a lovely looking ship. She's a very capable looking ship. She is worthy of the title. Cruiser de première classe. Yep, Cruiser de première classe. I love doing that, sorry. And she has an interesting career, but again, she's ordered in 1925, in November. She's laid down in April 1926. Built by the Arsenal de Brest, which is going to have a very interesting time. 
And when I say very interesting time, has an incredibly interesting time constructing the ships. But we'll leave that to one side. This all explains how she is laid down in April 1926, launched May 1927, okay, so roughly a line later, and then commissioned in March 1930. So technically, she, well, from ordering to commissioning, takes four years, four months. And seven days. Four years, four months, and a week, in other words. Yeah. Okay. Her pre war service was pretty cool. She spends most of her time in the First Light Division. She arrives in Toulon, being paired with Ducassine in April. Uh, 1930, and it would be her and Ducassine which would keep wandering around the world, especially taking over the role of the cruiser Cress Edgar Quinet, the armoured cruiser, which had been lost. Um, they do the training cruise that goes to Rio de Janeiro, French West Indies, and Casablanca, and then does a tour of the Mediterranean. So these are going around doing their presence and showing themselves off as these fast, powerful looking ships. Now, with the outbreak of the war in September uh, 1939, she was actually in the Far East, this flagship of the Indochina station. She'd be sent there to replace uh, Prima Gru, which was a Duguay Turin class light cruiser. She'd arrived in Saigon only in July 1939, and she would spend most of the beginning of her war hunting. Surface raiders. She'd be hunting surface raiders in the South China Sea and merchant vessels. And then she moved to the Indian Ocean after escorting an Australian troop convoy. And then she went to Alexandria and became part of Force X under the command of Vice Admiral Godfrey. Now, it was during that time she sailed in concert with the cruiser Tourville and fleet torpedo boat uh, Forbin to Beru. And then joined Ducassine and Duguay Turin, six days later, doing other things. Uh, it was her who sailed with the Duguay Turin in response to a report of it three Italian cruisers being moored at Tobruk. They found their vessels in the port and so returned to Alexandria that evening. And that was in June 1940. And then, after they got back, the official or notification of the French armistice with Germany was delivered. And the French ships are barred from the Barting the Harbour. It won't be till May 1943 that the ships of Force X rejoined the Allied cause, but we'll talk about that later. The fact is, she'd had a very interesting and already quite exciting career, and she was just about to get a couple of years off. Canon de 37mm. Model 1925. Again, the 1920s, a very useful gun, and this is pictured on the Fox. So, this is as accurate of pictures as I can get you. They're replaced by the 40mm and 20mm. 40mm uh, both of us, 20mm Oricons, of course, in due time. But they're mainly replaced because of the problems with keeping them working, maintaining them in terms of finding spare parts and ammunition rather than the 37mm of the French being an absolutely terrible weapon. Theoretical for rate of fire, though, was only 30 to 42 rounds per minute, whereas the practical was 15 to 21, which was even lower. Now, there are bright sparks out there, and I, love it will, and I will put this in the way Navy Webster does, which is far nicer than the way I put it who decide to write down 85 rounds per minute as being the rate of fire for the M1933. There is a small problem with this. That's the rate of fire for the twin barrel mount, i.e. the rate of fire from both barrels firing combined, not the rate of fire of the actual gun. 
So it's the rate of fire for the mount, not the gun. But overall, it is still a fairly decent weapon. It's got a angle of fire and a high rate of fire for the period it's in, in terms of the level of damage it does. Again, though, there is this problem with the French now. They're building quality. But it already seems to be dipping away by the time you get to the run-up to World War II. Or more accurately, you can say their attention has moved elsewhere. And... <sighs> Honestly, if I'm being charitable... And I'm trying to be the French because, remember, these are the people who have given us that wonderful phrase, which I'm going to keep sort of repeating. Quasi du premier classe. I like that. I like that a lot. If I'm being charitable, I would say that a nation with the land border and the neighbours that France has doesn't really have the time to focus as much on a navy as maybe a nation like Britain. Or America. I could also point out that Britain and America both have far larger industrial bases to work on. At this point, they do. The French defense industry is industry in, is interesting, but the sheer quantity of arms being produced are mostly, in terms of industrial might, especially for no weapons, are Britain and America. However, and this is where a slight measure of censure can start to enter the stats. The Dutch are in even worse a position than the French. The Dutch are even smaller than the French. The Dutch have just as large a land border. And yet the Dutch produce things like the Hazemere and other systems coming up. In a similar time period. We like to pretend the myth of radar, that radar is purely a British invention. Mm, the British might have got there first, there's a debate about it. probably got there first, but in terms of turning into workable systems and coming with ideas for how to use radar, there are many players in the field, but one of the ones who's curiously absent in terms of the proportion of emphasis you'd expect them to have in it is the French. It's a factor. Colbert. I like Colbert. She's pretty much the closest you get to Suffren. However, I said, she already has 90 millimeters instead of the 75s. And, well... As well as that, the aircraft car uh, catapults were moved forward to between the funnels, and two new cranes were fitted a beam of the second funnel. So, you know, there's some modification going on. She has an interesting service, an interesting career. I have to admit, the only one I don't have a specific picture of in terms of the ship is Fock. That is the only one I do not have an actual proper picture of. But Colbert has... A similar career to her sister, you know. She is employed a lot in terms of traditional cruiser duties, uh, taking part in the fleet inspection in the Bear Doyers in 1935, and when the first light division is renamed as the first cruiser division in 1937, it consists of Colbert, Foch, Duple, and Audrey. So it consists of the three sufferings barring suffering and Audrey. I see that as a bit rude. 
We're gonna we're gonna take three of the sisters here, but we're not gonna name the, take the one they're named for. She's part of the group which is assisting. Well, well she's combined with Neptune and Hermes, or maybe Leander class cruiser, and of course a light uh, light aircraft carrier, plus some contra torpillas, Milan and Cassad, that were Force X, along with she. Uh, it, she basically it centered on her and Duplex, her sister. They are positioned roughly 850 nautical miles from Permuco. Uh, when they hear about the engagement of her plates, they return to Dakar, refuel, and place themselves so that the Grass Bay can't get back home if she manages to escape to sea. What's interesting, of course, is that as they're doing that, that's the site's backup, but at the same point, Force K which is renowned in Arca Royal, is racing south at high speed. So there's a case of, okay, if by some measure you actually manage to escape Grass Bay, if you do, you then have to get past Renown and Arc Royal, who are steaming down at high speed. And if you get past them, don't worry, there's two Critter de Premier class. With, a, with a Leander, another Leander class, and a couple of Contratopilias, and an aircraft carrier sitting back behind them to go, Hello. We're here to be your very short-term friends. And with friends like us, you'll never want for enemies. <laughs> it's a skill. But she does various operations at various points. In fact, one of the things is she's part of a force which is almost is being prepared to be sent to reinforce North Africa when as part of the negotiations, and this comes up with Rusty's, she is retained after, you know, uh, due to the uh, Franco-German armistice, she actually doesn't leave too long. They stay, and they don't go. They don't. They they don't go away. They're sort of the the sailing is planned for the twentieth of June. They don't. It's cancelled, and so twenty fifth of June, when the when the armistice takes effect, they. Um, they then take part in all the actions to get Strasbourg back. They take part in all those operations. But when the Germans start their occupation, they're still in sort of Toulon when they, I think they're supposed to sort of sail out, to, you know, to get sort of some revenge at certain points to talk about it. But um, for Mezzo Kabir. But what they do do is they end up staying in too long and she's part of the fleet which gets sunk there interestingly enough the french were preparing the forces the hutner that's their sort of the marine national force in the, from the mediterranean fleet um were supposed to be deployed to north africa to help defend it from the torch landings but they're not permission to sail and one of the interesting things I often come up with as a theory, and as something to discuss, and I'll be talking about this later, if the forces of the Hutmer actually did sail, there are three courses of actions. One, they go straight to North Africa and they do nothing once they're in North Africa. Two, they sail and attack the Allied forces, in which case there's a very nasty battle they get involved in. The Allied forces are ready for it. The Allied forces' worst-case scenario includes a joint a joint Franco-Italian force attacking them, and they prepared for it. Or three, they sail, and once they're far enough away and close enough to the Allied forces, they signal and say, "We've come to join you." Those are options. Those are the options. We'll talk about it. But this is the machine gun, which is, again, you have the cyclic theoretical, 450 rounds per minute. 
the practical. 200 to 250 rounds per minute. And there is a whole debate as to whether it's fitted on ships or not. And uh, whether it's in single mounts, double mounts, quarter mounts, uh, and where it is fitted. I mean, they are fitted for, not with. And they are now fitted with. And they are fitted not. Well, they are fitted for single mounts, and then they have a twin mount put in. And because well, honestly, the weight differential is not that much for them to carry. And you have quad mounts, I suppose, to be fitted, but they have a pair of twins, and it's just, it's just fun. It's just fun. And before you start thinking this is a sort of this is gun, you know, it's a machine gun. Duh, 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 duh. Whilst it's widely used in 1930s and 1940s, and for it was also the gun that formed the basis for the Japanese uh, 13 and 25 millimeter A guns in World War II, and we know how successful those particular weapons were. However, the turret data is interesting. With a 51 gram bullet and an elevation of 4 and a half, 45 degrees, they could go 7,850 yards, that's 7,200 meters. The AA ceiling was 13,780 feet, or 4,200 meters. Whether with a twin mount or a quad mount, or a, a theoretically a single mount, which is theoretically what's fitted to Sufferin, but appears to actually be twin mounts, but we'll leave it to one side. Um, their elevation was negative 10 degrees to plus 90 degrees. The twin, no one's quite sure how much exactly it weighs, but the quad, 1.14 tons. They could do a 360 degree train, they were manually operated only, and the train rate was manually operated. So if you've seen the video of me and Dan operating the 40mm pom pom on Sackville, you will have an idea of roughly the speed you could go. And that was with, of course, an incredibly untrained crew. Now, between Fock and Suffren, there are some changes. Now, interesting enough, Fock changes its tripod around, then Duplex, which comes after Fock, changes its tripod back to the, ori uh, to the original Suffren design. Fock has a different style of sort of some cosmetic changes, and of course loses the coil of boilers, but to, in uh, to in uh, have extra bunker stowage for fuel oil. All these things make for differences. However, does it make it a different class? Not apparently the French papers. A French Navy. Not if we compare it to the town class, which are all considered the same class, despite the fact that the last two ones are freaking Leviathans compared to the rest, and were actually designed for a completely different tur turret. Um, which, if they'd actually managed to fit the quadruple six inch, would have made them into something approaching Armageddon. Especially from many Italian perspectives in World War II. And probably a few German perspectives. And could also have led to a completely different crown colony design, because you could imagine every case of, right then, we can put them down so they have the same uh, firepower as the regular town class, but they'll only have three turrets. Which would change quite a lot of perspectives on the ground, crown colony. And people would go, well, they have nine, and, you know, this is less than that, or twelve, and etc. But if you've got the Edinburgh and Belfast on 16, and then Crowns on 12, but three turrets. It makes sense. So, Bok is part of the class, and is a very good part of the class. Bok herself, though, has said, I don't have any pictures of. But, I do have some interesting, uh, a nice picture of the scuttling of the French fleet at Toulon. And this is Strasbourg, Colbert, Algerie, and Marseille. Now, the 
What's interesting is, of course, Darlan defects the Allies. His replacement, Gabriel Offan, correctly guesses that the Germans are intending to seize the fleet of Toulon, despite it being explicitly forbidden in the Franco-Italian Armistice and the Franco-German Armistice, and so orders it scuttled. Basically, despite Operation Anton being the occupation of the rest of France, carried out by Germany and Italy in November 1942, the French Navy, coupled with civilian resistance and assistance, managed to delay the Germans until the scuttling was complete. As such, Anton is judged a failure. The French managed to destroy 77 vessels. Several submarines escaped to North Africa. Only 39 small vessels are actually captured by the Germans. It's also the loss of pretty much the last of the bargaining chips, the last of the actual viable systems which they had with which to bargain with the Germans. One of the interesting things always about this is that Raider actually believed that French naval officers would not allow their ships to fall into the hands of a foreign nation and advised against it. He's led to believe that, though, that there is strong anti-British sentiment among the French sailors due to Mers al-Kabir, which is quite true, there is, to get on the side of the Italians. Um... His actual, Hitler's actual plan and the plan of the Grand Command seems to have been to seize the fleet and have German sailors capture the French ships and turn them over to Italy. Now, the thing that often gets into this is the debate of whether or not Raider, how much Raider disagreed with us. I don't think Hitler really managed to get the sailors and the cooperation needs if Raider doesn't realise that this is what's going on. So I sometimes feel there's a little bit of... Um, uh, after events re-engineering of historical facts going on here. Interesting enough, the French engineers themselves involved in the process actually modified the orders because the the initial orders had been to cap uh, to scuttle the ships by capsizing them. But in the interest of recovering the ships after the war, and this is actually what made it very easy for the Italians to recover some during the war for scrap metal value, uh, had them sink on an even keel. The fact that they managed it shows them with honour and shows that they did do their best to resist. It's often brought up the sinking of the fleet at Toulon, the scuttling of the fleet, in the same breath as Mers al-Kabir. And it's used as a case of the Royal Navy didn't need to do it. The British didn't need to do the sinking of the fleet. Okay. So this is where I can sound like an apologist for both sides, but honestly, I think Mers al-Kabir is a failure of communication on a strategic level. Yes, you can blame the officers at that level. You can say Somerville could have sent a more senior officer, especially in party with the officer sent, some of the Admiral, who's a rank, who the British had an idea was a bit of a rank obsessed guy, um, would take more notice of them. You could have said that the officer, the the French Admiral could have passed on the information up more fulsomely or could have acted if he's going to be take exercise latitude in terms of what information he passes up to his superiors, he could exercise the same latitude in how he interprets his in orders. You can do one bit. Those are both things. But what you have to remember is you have to put it in the context of the time. And the context of the time was the British had no trust in the French as a government because of what had happened, and the British were looking at the worst-case scenario. It's not the French Navy that they don't trust. They actually have... That's one of the reasons why they're dealing with the French Navy. They trust the Navy. They don't trust the French government, because the French government has negotiated behind their backs, in their view. The French would say, well, we, did, we, 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 we might have thought... We, we gave you hints, we just... Did and the British went, no, you didn't. Uh, the British thought the French, and uh, actually Churchill especially, thought that there would be the sort of Anglo-French Union would go on, would actually happen before anything like this happened. But no, that happens. This is the same French politician which hadn't trusted their army enough to actually equip them with decent communication systems, which is one of the reasons why you have the issues you have 
with the fall of France. So, yeah, it's not the Navy that the British government don't trust. It's the politicians above them giving them the orders. And that's where you get to the southern area. Because you've had this lack of communication on the higher level that they were surrendering. Which the British would probably have, um, they would have included with, well, if you're going to do that, then you have to do something about your Navy or we will. Because we can't afford for that Navy to fall into the Franco, uh, to the German and Italian hands. We just can't afford that. That's going to be far too strong. Because you have to remember, the entire system is predicated on the French and Italians cancelled each other out because they were the same size. That meant the British and Americans had a measure of superiority over the Japanese. This is the treaty system we're talking about. and that You, you cannot isolate it in this period and go, the British should have behaved this way. The British have done Copenhagen. They've done all sorts of things. Else. The British have a very simple policy when it comes to them being threatened and they per perceive naval forces being arraigned against them. They tend to destroy them. That's the base instinct for Britain and its survival. When it's given a choice between what it perceives as a threat to its survival and doing something which may or may not be regarded as honourable, they do the thing rather than risk their survival. In this case, yes, former allies. But you're out of their allies, they're the ships of an allies who belong to a government which negotiated behind the British back and didn't tell them when they're allies. So they don't trust them. They have absolutely no trust in the French government. That's the first thing. You could argue the British can leave, uh, can leave the ships there, that they are completely, the French will act with honour, but that requires the British to trust the French government. Not the French Navy, the French government. They then pursue an act, uh, act of negotiating, trying to negotiate with the French Navy. In which case, any ad other admiral would possibly be better. It, one of the interesting things I often have wargamed, in my mind, is flipping the admirals around and having Godfrey in Mez al Kabir and having Yamal, who was there, in Alexandria. Because it doesn't matter who's dealing with Cunningham, this outcome is probably much going to be the same. There is that level of force, you're in a British naval base, it will be dealt with by Cunningham. In pretty much the same manner. However, any other senior admiral, a French admiral, probably works better, with the, uh, uh, works better in that scenario. Either at saying, communicating with the British or communicating with the French. They communicate in the other way better. It's itself. But it fundamentally comes down to the British do not trust the French government. And that's where Mers al Kabir happens. Toulon shows you can trust the French Navy. They act with honour. But it's a very different... In 1942, when they do this, They've had a long time to prepare for it. In fact, they've had pretty much months of work and planning going into it quietly. And they have time to pull it off. In 1940, the British don't see that. And the British are looking at a French government, which is just in their mind, deserted them. And deserted their cause. It's not a nice decision to make, but it's one that was made. Now we come to some of the most powerful weapons on these ships. The torpedoes. Now, honestly, nine torpedoes for six, six tubes in two triple launchers. That's it before we even get into the whole trying to track down which torpedo it was. In the end, it wasn't that difficult, but the stats do change because the French like to use D in their torpedoes, but they only have one, 19, uh, one 23 D, which is actually the 23 DT, which is the 23 D designed for the T launcher, which allow me to push it down and work it out. But there is also the DA, but that is a mere 15.75 inch one. There is the 21.65 inch, because that's what 550 millimeters technically goes to. Uh, 24V and 24M, which are used for submarines. There's a 19D, which is used for pre-World 
pre World War One destroyers. Uh, there's the 19V, which also goes on those uh, uh, those same destroyers. Um, there is the M18, which is for capital ships and destroyers, and the M12V, which is for destroyers and capital ships. But technically, the 23DT is for destroyers and flotilla leaders. Cruiser Liger, remember. Cruiser Liger. And duplex. Duplex is another of those vessels sunk. And if we consider the picture earlier, we get Strasbourg, Cobra, Adria, and Marseille. Duplex is, was up there. Duplex is another vessel which is lost in the scuttling. And she's a good ship. In many ways, I'd say she's sort of a halfway point between the Suffrans and the Algeri. She retains the lack of coal, as far as I understand, from uh, as interested in influence in the Thok, but she returns to the uh, fire control arrangement and the specifically the mast arrangement of the Sofran and Colbert. However, she's fitted with twin 1930 secondary mounts rather than 1926 single mounts for her secondaries, which means she has an interesting arrangement because she technically has four twin 90 millimeters instead of eight singles. Which leaves her space. Which is possibly explains why her 1941 refit manages to take a uh, use up that space by cramming in a lot more 13.2 millimeters. She technically has four quads, four triples, and two twins. Plus um, three eight millimeter AA machine guns as well. She also has some of the heaviest armor of the ship by the time she scuttled, and she would have certainly been a very useful ship. Plus, let's be honest, she does look beautiful. But what I want to talk about with her is not her wartime involvement in Operation Vado, where her and some other her sisters take part in the, in the bombardment of Italy in the 13th and 14th of June, 1940. So this is the thing. There are, the French are a full, uh, French Navy, especially, are a full fighting participant in the war right up until they aren't. Which is another measure of shock for the Royal Navy because they hadn't seen it coming. Um, she bombarded, uh, taking part in the Genoa, uh, bombardment of Genoa and Vado. Honestly, the, the cruisers managed to do little damage as Genoa fires at the wrong target, Group Genoa, and Group Genoa was Duplex and Colbert, and Group Vado, which is Fock and Allegri, um, half their shells fall into the sea rather than hit the target. So, yeah, back to um, some gunnery training. Definitely back to some gunnery training. But pre-war, pre-war, this is the thing. She takes part in the cooperation of the film company for the production of Ville de Arms, which is one of the most... Well, it's a Top Gun star movie, let's be honest. There's, a love, uh, there's beautiful ships with a love story attached. And frankly, you delete the love story, you have these beautiful images of ships. And it's directed by Marcel Lehebia, and the duplex is made available for location shooting in around space in Toulon, and as much detail as possible is incorporated in the movie of the ship and its procedures. It's a really cool movie to watch, even with English subtitles underneath the French to try and work out what's going on, apart from the love scene, uh, love, well, not scenes, but the love story. It's just Okay, it's, let's put it this way. Maybe to modernise, because I've seen the variations of this movie so many times with the amount of cousins I have, but let me start you off with. Woman marries Captain. Well, hey, very happy marriage. However, turns out she dated one of his officers previously when she was younger. Oh, shock horror. Instead of telling Captain about this, she does not tell 
she tell she promise swears them both to secrecy. This causes bitterness in the uh, in the other officer who has not married the lady, and issues arise, and various things go on, torturous, etc. And eventually, there is an incident. I think the other officer dies, from what I could gather, um, in it. And uh, to save the captain's career, she has to admit various things. And I'm not quite sure if their love story. It, it got, honestly, I, I was bored with the love story. I, I switched off it when it was on the screen when I was watching it. But it's a good movie from looking at the ship. Rene Emile Godfrey. Now, I wanted to bring him in because he's the commander of the French force in Alexandra. Good, because he preserves the ships in terms of Alexandria and stops a war breaking out in Alexandria. Not so good because he takes his time to join the Free French, because he's always doing a question of honor thing. Eventually pushed into retirement because they're not sure he's exactly a um, great follower of the Gaul. In fact, they think he might prefer another general, or maybe even preferred an admiral to take the leadership of the Free French rather than the Gaul. But, what can I say? He was an officer of sufficient skill, put in a very testing and difficult moment, who managed to preserve Suffren and the rest of his ships to the best of his ability. Again, though, I am sat looking at these ships at certain points, and I think about the realities of World War II. And you always have to remember the British forces and British structures, and in many ways the British plans for war, are predicated on the French being in the war on their side. People often say, well, I don't see how the British can deploy a fleet to the Far East and fight the Germans and Italians. The point was they weren't supposed to. The point was the French were supposed to be taking the lead in fighting the Italians along with British help. And the Germans were, frankly, a tiny force when they're doing these plans in the, mid, uh, the early and mid-1930s. They're still fractionally really not that big a force in the late 1930s. It sort of it does that in their four strengths, but you know you compare them to everyone else, and they're not. The Germans have managed to achieve an outsized impact by doing things which no one else would really consider with their forces, not by having a large number of forces. So, the summary for the suffering class: I like them. I like these ships. They are good little ships, and they really are little ships in my mind. And that's fine. The French are happy with that. As I've repeated to you many times, these are not Croisier Cuirass. Croisier Cuirass. They are Croisier de Première Classe. Croisier de Première Classe. They are lovely, but they are not and never intended to be heavy cruisers because they start off as Croisier Legumes, like cruisers. The only real problem I have with them is that limitation of firing arc on their guns. I just... <laughs> you design the ship as well as you do, with the space for the firing arcs you do, and then you go, yeah, right, and we're going to put them in the mounts, and those mounts, okay, let's let's talk about those mounts. Uh, they are going to be limited to, oh, yeah, plus, minus 90 degrees. Uh, let's see, uh, the models... 1924 and 1921 had an elevation range of plus or minus uh, minus five degrees to plus 45 degrees and they had a training as i've said of plus 90 to negative 90 degrees it's fine you don't need to necessarily make them 360 degree uh, movement uh, turrets we'd all love it but you know you can't necessarily but if you look at their designing, the forward ones could probably do... Mm, plus or minus 135 degrees. In fact, I'd say all of them could probably do 135 degrees. Which would give you... 
a far greater arc of we can sweep with eight guns all that distance and all that distance. And they're good. They can move. Their train rate is six degrees a second, which is not a bad thing. Their loading angle is minus five to plus ten degrees. Okay. Their gun recoil, recoil is all fine. You sit there and just go, what happened? What is known is that the French actually had a cruiser program that was intended to replace the Duguay Thruin class. And they were to be a 10,000 ton cre uh, treaty cruiser from the Audrey, but having nine 203 millimeter eight inch guns in three triple turrets. These turrets were to be an improved design with an improved space of training and rate of train. So that would have been a really interesting design if it had been built. I do wish that some of them had been built, and it's a uh, called the Saint Louis design. Now, the Sukhov. I also want to add on while we're talking about the two hundred nine, uh, uh, the two hundred, uh, the gun, the two hundred three millimeter gun. Could took two and a half minutes to. Uh, to commence firing. These from the order could be prepped and ready to go in a minute using their ready stocks, which they had sort of to rapidly put up. Which shows the tremendous difference in the space between a cruiser and a cruiser submarine. So, very good ships. Right, notes about what's coming up or what am I going to be doing. Uh, if you are free on Saturday and Sunday and you happen to be heading towards, I don't know, Chalk Valley on Saturday or Tankfest on the Sunday, on the Sunday Tankfest, both me and Draken NFL will be wandering around. I'll be wearing an orange shirt both days. You can, with my logo on, Please, uh, um, on terms of the Saturday, Chalk Valley is notorious for its bad signal. Please get in contact beforehand if you want to. If you want to say, can't say hi, and we'll arrange something. But otherwise, I'll probably be hanging around in Chalk Valley. I'll be hanging around with a gaggle of naval historians and wandering around, and I'll be wearing an orange T-shirt, and I look like this. There are lots of people though who look like this there, but I it'd probably be near something called the trenches probably near something called sword fighting, and I'll be wandering out, and I might even be wearing my hider hat. So, hider hat and orange t-shirt, with channel details on, and that will probably be me. For both days. I'm looking forward to it, and I'm looking forward to saying hi to you. As for this, well, this was the suffering class, which are nice ships. What have we got coming up? Uh, we've got the Algerie class there in August. We've also got some more of the small cruisers from the Royal Navy, one day class. And yeah, we've got Northamptons coming up in July. And also, whilst I'm away in August, I do point this out, you might notice there are some differences in the lives there. The reason there is differences is because there are at least two weeks I'm going to be away teaching for Justin Craig, the first and the third week of the month, as a basically I'm off running their summer camps course director. I'm not sure what I'm doing the second week. I might be doing more teaching. I might be doing it going out and doing some other things. Either way, I will try and run, I will run those two, hopefully there's two patrons. And while I'm away on those travels, there will be the series coming out, which... I have discussed with you a fair number of you already, which is the special suggested by the very nice gentleman, 
Mr. Wayne Borian, who suggested that do an evaluation of each combat Navy model too and give us a li your list of their top five weaknesses in order, why those weaknesses existed and how those weaknesses could have been addressed, if at all, on dates of the January the 1st, 1939, January the 1st, 1940, January 1st, 1941, and January 1st, 1942. So what I've done is I've taken that and I've designed that into two sets, each of three videos. So, uh, well, no, I've designed it for two sets of each of three videos. Uh, well, how do I put it? Two sets of two groups of three videos. So that makes much sense. So there'll be three videos on the January 1st, uh, 1939, and three videos on January 1st, 1940, which will come up in the first week in August, and three videos on the January 1st, 1941, and three videos on the January 1st, 1942, which will come up in the second week, uh, third week in August. And they will start off on the Sunday because brew ships won't be happening on the Sunday as normal. It'll be happening on the Saturday or etc. And then it will run through to the Friday. And carry and well, actually, no, it'll run through to the yes, it'll run through to the Saturday. So it'll be Sunday, Monday, not Tuesday because that's the cruise along patrol. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then there'll be a brew ships on that Sunday. So that's what's happening while I'm away, and those will be the two weeks I am away. Will be like that. <laughs> So the 31st of July brew ships won't happen. That'll be the 30th of July. <laughs> Just realized I programmed that one in on the wrong, the wrong date on the July. But yeah, that's why there was sort of a funny looking guy on my face because I'm going, oh, well, that doesn't work out in the mass. And so, yeah. That'll all be good. I hope you'll enjoy it. Which probably means Yeah. I've got the dates wrong for the August one. I've worked out the math slightly wrong on the dates, but I have explained it correctly. I'll, they will be fixed on the volumes. And as mentioned at the beginning, why I'm not doing the French shipyards is because they're gonna be a big part of the live and long patrol for that on the 7th of July on French 1920s and British cruiser design doctrine. And for the Italian 1920s, 1930s cruiser doctrine, it's going to be, well, a return to why exactly did the Italians get quite so obsessed with those particularly beautiful, very, very slim cruiser designs? It's going to be fun. And the patrons we've got coming up is Why Retire Animals in World War and Modern Frigates, Cruisers by Another Name, which is pretty modern history, but well, it works. It's something worthwhile considering. It's another spin on the question of why is studying history worthwhile for studying uh, for evaluating modern operations? If you can go, well, hang on, what we're doing with the ships is what we've always been doing with the ships. So this is why it's worthwhile studying. So that's why it's worthwhile looking at that question. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and uh, yeah, take care. This is probably going to have been edited a bit and chopped in because I've had a couple of interruptions while filming this. So if there are some bits which are sort of weird or you see a hand waving them, that's because I've done some editing. Take care. Oh, almost forgot the questions. So, I always end these up with questions, and I'm not going to forget it this time. The question for this one, and it's for the sort of those of you who are thinking about these things. So, the French have the Cousin de Première Classe. Cousin de Première Classe. Cruiser de deuxième classe. Cruiser de deuxième classe. And. 
Cruiser Cuirass. Cruiser Cuirass, or Armoured Cruiser. If you had been designing a system with a heavy cruiser, a light, uh, 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 let's say dividing up the light cruisers into this sort of first and second class, and a, he and a true heavy cruiser, what would your structure have been for the treaties? Because we've been doing this a lot of talk. What do you think it would have been sensible as? What do you think of it? Because they've gone for 10,000 tons standard. So if you were going to go for it, look, hang out uh, and go, right then, I'm going to allow you a few heavy cruisers, but they're going to be limited in number. So you're going to have first and second class light cruisers, and you're going to be allowed a couple of heavy cruisers. And because none of us are building this, we're doing this based off the large light cruiser, which is going to be the basis of the Premier, or the first class light cruiser. Let's figure out what would it be. What would you have done it as? Because I'd be really interested in crowdsourcing and seeing. And if you have any designs or ideas like that, please send those pictures to me on Discord. I love it. I love looking at the pictures. And if there's really good ones and a lot of interest, then I might put together a little video based on them and discussing the ideas, if there's enough of them. If it's just one person's, then it's me just discussing one person's ideas. But if there's three or four people who put them in, then I can have a good discussion and go through. If you don't mind them being historically evaluated. Thank you very much, and um, thank you.